Yes, thank you. I have to say I deserve that applause. And uh, <laughs> not because of my new book, not because of my new book, but because it's been almost, it's been almost 10 years to the day since my last root canal. <laughs> and I know a lot of you don't think that's a big deal. A lot of you may have never had one. There may even be some people in the audience who have never, you probably never, you don't think I deserve applause for this. But for me, this extended period of tooth happiness is a real achievement. It's my smile stone. I have a terrible teeth, a tragic dental history. I've had nine root canals, 12 crowns, two bridges, and approximately 4,328 cavities filled. Okay, that was an exaggeration. I've spent so much time in a dental chair that they should probably endow one in my name, except I've also been a really terrible dental patient, and uh, my last dentist moved to Germany. <laughs> I think that I, I gave rise to this idea that dentists have a high rate of suicide. Um, I used to think that this was my fate and there was nothing I could do about it. But then I actually learned that there is something you can do about it as long as you're willing to be extremely vigilant. And I learned about the actual basis for this need for vigilance from Bonnie Bassler, who was this wonderful microbiologist at Princeton University, who really let me know what kind of enemy I was up against, and that is dental plaque. Uh, she explained to me that about 600 different species of bacteria cooperate in the job of causing whatever dental problems you have, whether cavities or, or gum disease, and each one of these different species of bacteria is really as different from one another as humans would be from Martians, she said. So you have one species that might be able to metabolize the sugar residues on your teeth, another is good at clinging to the enamel. The next might release these abrasive chemicals that actually um, begin scraping at the enamel. And you can't see any of these little microbes. You know, if you had a, a pin, a head of a pin, you could probably wallpaper the top of, them, of that head with about 20 million of them. But you can feel them if you have your finger across your teeth and you feel that slimy stuff, that's actually the dental plaque there. Um, so when you brush and floss away at night and you gargle with Listerine, if you're like me, uh, you know, I do this now. I brush for at least two minutes a night. I have three different kinds of floss. I use Listerine for two minutes. And you kill like 99.9% .9 of them. But here's the thing. The next day, uh, they're all back again. <laughs> and not just willy-nilly either. They'll be back, she says, with the same highly ordered structure, the same architecture every time. So I've been very vigilant about waging war against plaque. And Bassler made me understand on a sort of cellular and molecular level why it was necessary to do so. Uh, so the principles of the architecture of that organization, the principles that I'm trying to get at here and tell you that my personal story of dental plaque really all come down to power of the cell, the cell, the bacterium is a cell, and the power of the bacteria is in the fact that the cell is this really powerful principle that I discuss in the canon as a basic organizing principle of life on Earth. So we have these cells that are able to do these amazing things, individual single-celled organisms that these bacterium are, and at the same time, the second organizing principle of these bacteria and the reason why they cause what's, you know, create what's almost like a multicellular organism in your mouth is that they're able to communicate with each other. So they're actually always signaling each other. And in fact, that's the way multicellular organisms work. They have the autonomy of the individual cell combined with this incredible ability to communicate, unlike me at the moment. Um, and in fact, when they recently sequenced the entire human genome, they found that half of the genes in it seem to be dedicated to cell-cell communication. It's a sort of original cell phoning going on here. So the principle, the basic principle of the cell, the basic principle of cells communicating with each other, this autonomy combined with community, is one of these things that's basic to understanding biology and the organization of life on Earth. 
This is the approach that I take in the canon. I talk about things always on these kinds of ultimate ideas of each field. I've been a science writer now. I just realized this <clears throat> for more than half my life, and I've spent my, my life writing mostly about science news. But in the course of doing that, I came to understand that for most people, all science is news. I mean, it's just true that people don't really pay attention, they don't understand or follow some of the basic ideas that underlie the news. The basic um, principles, the basic starting points that they may have learned in school and forgotten, or maybe they never learned or they didn't care. They've tried very hard to forget. A lot of them have said that to me. They've been trying to recover from their high school chemistry teacher, um, and they're, you know, 52 years old, and they're still in recovery. So there's a lot of problems with the way science is taught. And so I, after writing about science and science news for so many years, I decided, well, it's time to talk about the basics again, because I actually think that if you have a grasp of the basics, it's much easier to follow the news. I mentioned cells. Of course, stem cells are very much in the news. But one of the things I found is that most people don't really understand what a cell is or why we even, I mean, why we're arguing over stem cells. So getting back to the basics, getting some of these basic ideas across, if you have them in place, if you have a grasp of them, it's a lot easier to follow the news, to follow all of these ideas that are coming up that are really important to us, uh, you know, genetic engineering. Do we know what DNA is? Do we know where genes are located? Do we know what they do? These are all ideas that I think people feel maybe a little bit embarrassed about that they don't quite know. So I thought, well, okay, maybe this is something to put together into a book. What I did in putting together the canon is I went around and talked to scientists all over the country, indeed even uh, all over the world. I asked them, what do you wish people understood about science? And um, I mean, most of them, of course, want people to understand enough about science so that they just give them unlimited grants and don't ask any questions. But <laughs> the truth is that they also have some, some very defined ideas about what they think public misunderstanding of science is. And they kind of fall into two categories. One is the general ideas about science, and the other are the particular ones about their field. And so the approach I took after talking to all of these scientists and finding the same themes coming up, up over and over again was to sort of organize them by field, first by general and then by field. So, I mean, what is it about science that people don't get? One of the things that's really at the heart of it, and I think that all of the scientists emphasize this above all, is that science is not a body of facts. It's not the static thing. It's a very dynamic process. It's a way of looking at the world. It's evidence-based. It's, it's rational. It's, uh, it's something where you actually try to look at the environment around you and isolate individual elements and home in on them. Um, one of the really most telling events that happened in the course of my writing, this, reporting this book, was I went to this guy at Yale, this biochemist at Yale, and he was, he was kind of a little bit of a, a military sort of guy. And he was, had this very strict idea about what I should and should not write in this book. And one of the things he did is, I want to show you what science is all about. And he says, do you know how to play the game Mastermind? Um, well, I didn't. I, quite frankly, had never even heard of it. And he says, uh, I'm going to teach you how to play Mastermind. And I said, um, <clears throat> no, I'm not very good at games. You know, he says, I have a point to make, and I'm going to teach you Mastermind. So he goes and gets out his little kit of Mastermind. I don't know if any of you know how to play this game. My daughter and husband both turned out to know it and, and love it. And, and uh, I was, uh, as soon as he took it out, I'm almost in tears. So he takes out this little pegboard and all these little <laughs> pegs to go in. And the idea is that these different colored pegs and people are you know, two sides, you're supposed to be able to determine what the other person's lineup of colored pegs is based on whether they put black or white ones here and so on. And you, what you're trying to do is sort of get to the point where by using your pegs, you're analyzing what his, pe his colored pegs are. And, you know, so he explains it to, it to me and then he says, okay, let's play. And we start playing and I'm doing really badly. I'm getting worse as it 
going on and I'm sweating and I'm starting, you know, I could feel like these tears at the sun. I said, please, don't you have any nice PowerPoint presentation to show me instead? But in the course of making me play the game, he really did make me see that this was what science was all about. It was trying to isolate one variable, keep that one variable, that one little colored peg, focus it on it, change conditions around it, and see if you can understand what that, that colored peg is, that one thing. And so that really gave me a sense of what it was. I mean, you, you look out in, in your world and you, you figure you can't make sense of it one way or the other. But actually, when you start focusing in on one variable at a time, all of a sudden you have this incredibly powerful method for getting at what is a reasonable understanding of reality. This is something I think that's gotten lost in opinions. We are now awash in opinions. We're awash in talk of, uh, of faith-based this and that. And we've forgotten that science is this very powerful, reasonable, sensible method for getting at understanding our world. So this was one of the sort of the overarching messages. Not a body of facts. I'm not giving you a book that's something to memorize. I'm giving you something where this is really the way scientists think and look at the world. And it's turned out to be a very fruitful one. The other thing that, um, <clears throat> that they really emphasized, every single scientist I talked to emphasized, they wished that people had a better understanding of probabilities, statistics. Probabilities and statistics. And why do they care? Why do they think this is important that people don't know now? This is not about math. This is really more about quantitative thinking and estimating and knowing what randomness is, what true randomness is. Because one of the problems that people have is they don't really understand how likely or unlikely probable things, something is to happen. So they start to see patterns where it's actually just a continuation of randomness. And this was really, this was really made very clear to me by talking to this statistician at Berkeley who every year she starts off her statistics class, her first year statistics class, and she divides the class into two groups. And one group she says, you're going to flip a coin a hundred times and write down your answers, heads and tails, what, what you get. And the other half, you're going to imagine doing that and write down what you think you would get. And so then she leaves the room and the kids do this and then they put their answers up on the desk and she comes back in and she looks at them and she can immediately tell, she says, this is real, this is fake, this is real, this is fake. And they're always amazed, how can this be that she can tell so easily? And it turns out that real, real randomness is a lot less random looking than the faked randomness. So that what you see happening in the real randomness, if you really, and I did this myself, I did it many times, sitting there, you know, flip, flip, flip. Then I discovered there were computer programs that would do it for me, and so then I did it. Um, but one of the things you see is you start to see all of these patterns showing up. So that you would get long clumps of head, 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 head. And you would start to see that there were, um, it was a lot less of this flipping back and forth. Whereas when people are faking it, they start to get nervous. You know, you do three heads in a row and you say, oh, I better flip it. And so they do. And you can start to see that. And in fact, when I was doing this myself, I got as many as like nine heads in a row, just randomly, and I think I would never think to do that if I were faking it, because it would just feel as though somehow that just can't be, that there would have to be somebody in charge making those nine heads come up. So what happens when people see these kinds of random patterns is they start to impute meaning to it. So this was one of the messages. And I also um, learn about the bell curve and how everything in the world, it's amazing, falls into a bell curve. If you measure just about anything that you come across, you want to take measurements of pinky sizes. You want to take measurements of um, like the number of petals around a daisy. What you'll find is that they all start to fall into this bell, cur bell curve of you know, a rare, you know, a lot. You know, if it has more than the average or less than the average, just these two little tails, but most of it does start to fall into this really nice bell-shaped pattern. So you start to see that this is, this is what reality is. It's one big bell-shaped curve. And then, in fact, you know, regression to that bell-shaped curve, or what's called regression to the mean, 
is also the way everything tends to happen. So it's very difficult to maintain these kinds of extremes. You start to see everything shifting back. Why is that, why is that important to know? This thing is also shifting back to this. Um, <laughs> it's important because, again, we start to impute a lot of meaning to things when if you're taking some kind of alternative medicine and you st when are you taking the alternative medicine, you tend to take alternative medicine when you get to the end of an illness that has a natural kind of cycle to it and you're about to regress back to that, that sort of mean of homeostasis of health and that's when you're likely to try something as a kind of a last resort and what do you know, it works. So this shifting back Regression to the mean is another one of these principles. So I get that, princi that principle ac across. So that, that was another thing, that those general principles. Third general principle was um, scale. Talk about scale. Because scientists work in scales that are beyond the human scale most of the time. It's either very small, very big, very short, very long. It's very rare that we, they actually are doing experiments with things on our everyday human scale. So just getting a sense of how tiny things are or how long things are, that's a kind of a general principle that we, we tend to forget or maybe never quite grasp in what scientists are all about. So then after that, I talk about the individual fields and what some of the basic principles are in each field. And again, emphasizing that it's not a static body of knowledge. I don't try to sort of give a lot of bulleted things or this, you should know this, or a glossary here, the terms that are important, but rather, what are some of these organizing ideas in each field where if, if you grasp them, it actually makes it much easier to understand everything else. Um, I think that in understanding, to understand physics, it helps to really know what the atom is about. And again, it's this kind of, one of the things that's a theme in a lot of different sciences that pulls them all together is this idea of quanta, of things being these kind of individual units that can kind of be stacked together into making larger things. Why is it the quanta? Why is everything sort of quantum in that, in that ultimate sense? Well, as one of the physicists put to me, it's much easier to actually reproduce something, if you can imagine reproducing a word, letter by letter, you can sort of replicate it much more easily than trying to get a color reproduced. So that's kind of the way our quantum nature is. It's, it's sort of all these little things being built up together. And that's one of the reasons why things work so well, because there is something that is that kind of modular unit that's being shifted around. You see this coming up in every single field, this idea of modularity um, combined with communication between those modular units. So the, those are just some of the ideas that I try to get across. Physics, chemistry, chemistry is very difficult, very hard, because of all the sciences, chemists feel the most defensive. They feel like they're really unappreciated, that people think that they're not very sexy. Um, <laughs> And even other scientists, they complain that even other scientists don't appreciate the centrality of chemistry to everything. And so that's a little bit harder to make sexy than, you know, physics or astronomy. It's one of these things that people say, oh, I flunked high school chemistry and that's the end of it. Um, but in truth, molecular bonds, chemical bonds, understanding the bonds that hold us all together, the energy that's held in those bonds, breaking them apart, recreating them in different configurations. Again, the modularity combined with communication. So that actually all starts to fit together too. And then moving from there into biology, um, another thing that all, all scientists said to me, no matter what their discipline, please talk about evolution. People have to know that evolution is for real. Um, this is something that they're very concerned about, that there's been this constant hammering away at evolutionary theory, and therefore this edifice, this towering edifice of uh, evolution by natural selection is being questioned in ways that are just silly. Um, so I, I talk a lot about evolution, and I talk about the cell, and I talk about DNA. These are the basic concepts that I really believe that if people have a kind of a, a visceral grasp of them, that a lot of science just falls into place. And geology, one of the wonderful ideas about geology is that what explains practically everything that we see on Earth today is that 
our Earth is this really hot ball. I mean, it's really, it's incredibly hot in the center of the Earth, and most of this heat was, it's still caught in there from the origin of the solar system 4.8 billion years ago, and it's, and it's this hot ball in frigid space, and that heat is trying to escape, and in trying to escape, it's creating all the things that we see. So these, just these basic ideas that, you know, start to fit together, and the sciences actually fit together too, which is why I use the, the idea of the whirligig or the carousel, because there is a kind of a, a continuity among the sciences, and it is also a dynamic continuity. And finally, uh, astronomy, I talk about astronomy as, well, I talk about the Big Bang, the evidence for the Big Bang, which is really a wonderful, I mean, it's wonderful the kind of evidence that we have for it, but it's also, I think, something that's eluded people. Why do we believe in the Big Bang? So I go through that. And also the fact that we are all star stuff. We are all of us, all, the, most of the elements in our body were created in these supernova that exploded and basically gave birth to us. But also one of the ideas about astronomy that is so cool to me is that, you know, we associate it with the night, but in fact everything we know from astronomy about the structure of the universe, about what's out there, how far away it is, we know by studying light. We know by studying the light rays that reach us from these distant objects. And that's all we have to go on. You know, it's not as though we can touch it or hold it or do experiments on it the way you can with cells. We all have to rely on these light beams, and each one of them has a story to tell about where it's come from and where it's been. And through just studying light in many different ways, we've come to understand an enormous amount about our universe, and that to me is so cool. And this is, of course, the so cool part of science is what I try to get across again and again, the beauty of it and the elegance of it, and the fact that it's one of the great achievements of the human race, if you ask me. It's something that we should all be proud of and we should all participate in to the extent that we can follow it and appreciate it because I think it's really about people getting it right for a change. I mean, so much of what you read in the newspaper is about people getting it wrong and about things blowing up. And this is about things being sort of built up and created. It's also an international effort. It's a model, I think, for the way in which humanity can get along. I mean, scientists are smart, and they're not particularly, I mean, they're not always pleasant, and they're not always, I mean, it's not like they're born utopian socialists. They are not. They're very competitive, very hard driving, very critical of each other. I mean, they can bring each other to tears by tearing, you know, their, their presentations apart. But you get people from all countries, from every country, even countries that we have nothing else to do with. The scientists are communicating with each other because they have these, these principles that they're working under and these convictions that this is an incredibly fruitful way for understanding the world. And so they get along and they cooperate in a way I haven't seen with perhaps any other endeavor. So I do try sometimes sound a little bit like a cheerleader for science, and I know that there's a lot of problems that come out of scientific research, um, and scientists know it too. And they're, I think, you know, amazingly concerned about some of the implications of the work that they've done and about some of the, the difficulties that have been unleashed as a result more of technology than of science and basic research per se. So they, they tend to be aware of it. Um, but I still think that in the end, that science and the scientific understanding of the universe is something that gives me a lot of pleasure and it gives me a lot of hope. And that's what I try to convey in this book is that sense of, I'm a gloomy person, but I can still get really, when I read about science, it somehow gives me that sense that, ah, maybe we really can move this thing forward that we're not sort of necessarily doomed. Um, I want to read a few passages from the book, so you can also get a sense of that kind of the style I take, too. Um, I'm going to start by reading, since I began by talking about bacteria. Read a little bit about that. Wherever you go, there they are, doubtily doing the world's dirty work. Dig up a gram of soil, 
a loamy pinch that you could fit easily in a thimble, and you're looking at thousands of different species of bacteria, many of them detritus recyclers, breaking up the dumped and the dead and making them fit for new life. Or consider termites, the primary groundskeepers of tropical rainforests. They gnaw through dead or rotting trees and return much of the woody wealth back to the forest floor. What is a termite but a set of jaws joined to a petri dish? It's got a dense micro-ecosystem of many hundreds of strains of microbes. Bacteria allow termites to wrest sustenance from sawdust and, like Geppetto, give dead wood a voice. Bacteria live everywhere and in the most hell-forsaken nowheres. They live on the summit of Mount Everest and at the bottom of the sea. They live in polar ice caps and by boiling hydrothermal vents. They survive deep within rocks buried deep underground. They suck up heavy metals and oil spills and do laps in Love Canal. One bacterial species aptly named Deinococcus radiodurans can withstand a blast of radiation 1,500 times greater than the dose that would kill us and 15 times greater than what would stir fry that canonical survivor, the cockroach. Yet, as admirable as bacteria may be for their pan-planetary powers and boundless vim, that brilliance ultimately redounds to a brilliance even grander, handier, and more foundational than theirs, the supreme brilliance of the entity of which bacteria and every other being on Earth is built, the cell. The cell is surely the greatest invention in the history of life on this planet, and ever since the first cell arose, as the Nobel laureate Gunter Blobel said, it has been all cell all the time, a never-ending splitting of cells to make more cells, to keep life alive in the only way it knows how, in the context of the cell, by the bow plan of the cell. So, what is it about cell? Well, <clears throat> on the one hand, all these species of bacteria that I've been talking about is, <clears throat> are all very different from one another. Every strain endowed with a subset of specialty genes that allows it to exploit strange resources like benzene or mercury and to weather the specific withering conditions of its niche. On the other hand, if you were to crack open any of these bacterial cells, you'd realize that they all look and feel very like-minded inside similar chemical conditions, similar balance of acid and base, and the internal milieu of a bacterial cell is much like that of one of our liver cells or heart cells or any other cell of any other organism on Earth. This is the beauty and the power of the cell and one of the core insights to emerge from modern biology. A cell confronts the harshness and instability of the outside world by making itself a haven a cell contains all the tools it needs to preserve order and stability within its borders, to keep its interior recesses warm and wet and chemically balanced. In this equilibrated, level-headed setting, the cell's vast labor force of enzymes will operate at peak performance and so sustain the cell in its state of mild grace. There is nothing more natural than a cell. The natural world, after all, is full of them. At the same time, a cell is the ultimate act of artifice, a climate-controlled limousine with cushioned seats in a private bar cruising through a mad desert storm. Next, I'm going to um, read to you from the, the evolution chapter. I started off with a discussion of going to see this evolutionary biologist out of Berkeley who, who showed me this wonderful this little sort of gecko and uh, it was so beautiful. And I looked at it, and I thought at first, you know, I really did. I thought it was something, uh, it was like a little piece of artwork that he was showing me, like some toy or something, because its colors were just these translucent, iridescent, and neon pinks and blues and turquoises. And, and then all of a sudden, it moved. And I went like, whoa, I said, that's real? He said, of course it's real. You <laughs> know, what did you think? But I, I think that that point about how you can't believe what you see is actually a very important thing to keep in mind. The fake fakery is part of the take home message here. In biology, you should never believe your disbelief. There are so many species that arouse one's suspicions that look too, too, too stagey, too silly, too gothic, too elegant, too momentous, too perfect. 
Every time I see a toucan, I'm dubious. I still am. Its hulking yellow bill seems out of all proportion to the rest of its body and just barely attached to its face, as though the bird had stuck its beak into a giant banana and decided it liked the effect. <laughs> and speaking of improbable schnozzes, let's not snub this star-nosed mole, a semi-aquatic animal found throughout eastern North America. I don't know if any of you have ever seen these. Ringing its snout are 22 fleshy, pinkish, red, highly sensitive tentacles that when fully extruded and wriggling about in search of food look like a pinwheel of earthworms or children's fingers poking up from below in a cheap but surprisingly effective horror movie. Surely the star-nosed mole didn't just happen. Surely there is a disgruntled employee in some dank basement cubicle to blame. In fact, when 19th century European naturalists first encountered the duck-billed platypus of Australia and New Zealand, with its shuffling lizard-like gait, its beady little eyes and slits for ears, its webbed feet and oar-shaped tail, and that outlandish, rubbery, bluish-black Mark's brother of a mouthpiece, which doesn't even have the courtesy to quack, they were convinced the animal was a hoax. <clears throat> Not until several dozen platypuses have been killed and dissected were the skeptics finally placated. So then I go on to talk about how, you know, we see things that look as though they're designed, but they're not. I mean, they're not designed by uh, somebody who has anything in mind. It's, it's natural selection, which is one of the most, uh, <laughs> sometimes, you got to wonder about natural selection, some of the things it comes up with, including ourselves. Um, <laughs> things about ourselves, for example, why is it so easy to choke on a pickle? Well, it's because in learning, it, it, the advantages of being able to speak meant that things happened very quickly so that our, uh, the two tubes, uh, this air and um, food tube ended up being not separated sufficiently because of the way in which the tongue had to move in the muscles of the tongue. And it happened relatively quickly. So if you look at a chimpanzee, a chimpanzee doesn't have this problem, but we do. But the advantages of being able to talk were great enough to, I guess, outweigh the occasional loss of death by a piece of pretzel. <clears throat> but if you actually look at the way things are designed, you can see that it's pretty, it's all a pastiche. Everything's sort of plucked on top of everything else. And the last part I want to read to you is um, from my astronomy chapter. Now, in the astronomy chapter where I talk about, as I said, the Big Bang and how stars create all the elements of which we are composed, I also end it with a discussion of whether or not there's life on other planets, which is a question everybody has and that astronomers don't really have much to say about yet but they can't help themselves. They always end up talking about it because I think they feel the way we do, which is that if we were to find intelligent life elsewhere, it would be one of the most spectacular discoveries ever. And I think that we're all sort of constantly hoping that it will happen. Um, and I, for one, I mean, I think that's why I watch Star Trek even now. It's because I feel like that's the closest I'm ever gonna get to it. But I was just talking to somebody um, a few weeks ago, Seth Shostak, who works for SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and he actually said he comes, he has a, a way of looking at it. He thinks that they're 10 to 15 years away from contacting us, so he thinks it's going to happen uh, in our lifetime, which I think he's probably, uh, I think he's an N of one who believes this, but I think that it's nice, to, it's nice to hear from somebody who's semi-official about it. Um, but saying that, all astronomers, virtually all astronomers I interviewed, think there's life out there, uh, that it's impossible that there wouldn't be, that there's just the probabilities of it, that the, the sample space of it is too huge for it to not have happened elsewhere. So I'll just um, read a little bit about that. Astronomers find comfort in how relatively quickly life arose on Earth after the crust had cooled and the unshakable conviction with which life has stood its ground ever since. They point to recent work in the field of nanotechnology, the chemistry of materials constructed on extremely small scales, showing that carbon molecules spontaneously form rings, tubes, and spheres, the very sort of skeletal structures on which life is draped. 
carbon is a common constituent of supernova shrapnel, they say, and if carbon so readily self-assembles into the precursors of biomolecules, the rise of life may be virtually inevitable if carbon finds itself self-assembling in certain settings, for example, on a planet with liquid water to its credit. Again, not an outrageous demand. Water like car carbon is commonplace, and though most of the cosmic quotient of water looks to be in gaseous or frozen form, there are sure to be other liquid oases in the vast sample space that is outer space. Here on Earth, anywhere you find liquid water, you find life, said Andy Ingersoll of Caltech. Life is remarkably robust when it comes to adapting to extremely cold or hot water or very acidic water or water with all sorts of additives it's hard to imagine, given the robustness of microbial life, that if there's liquid water somewhere else, life hasn't found a way to exploit it. But on the question of how complex any of that extraterrestrial life may be, and whether there are other technologically sophisticated civilizations with whom we could, in theory, communicate, astronomers become far more reserved. When you start asking what is the probability that life, once it has developed, will evolve something sufficiently intelligent that it tries to communicate and travel around, well, I don't think we're in a position to make a useful estimate of that, said Dave Stevenson of Caltech. Nevertheless, a few resilient souls have sought to do exactly that. Most famously, Frank Drake, then a Cornell astronomer and a founder of the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Initiative, or SETI, in the 1960s offered his methodical approach to calculating how many communicative societies may be out there in the Milky Way, a formulation now known as the Drake Equation. Drake's take consists of seven variables to consider, proceeding from such comparatively straightforward facts as the rate of new star formation and the number of stars likely to have planets, and progressing into ever softer and more subjective terrain, including the odds that a particular life-bearing locale will give rise to intelligent life, that the intelligence will be of a tinkering, tool-making type, not an inevitable, and finally, that the technologically adroit civilization, having reached the point where it is capable of sending its hellos our way, will persist long enough to hear our reply. Dave Stevenson observes that the most uncertain and potentially deflating parameter of the Drake equation is the last one. If the lifespan of an advanced civilization is only a few thousand years, then the probability of another intelligent civilization coexisting with us becomes low, he said. Other civilizations might have come and gone before us, and new ones may be in the process of forming, but by the time they do, we'll have destroyed ourselves. Either way, we could well be the only one in the galaxy at present. But take heart. Remember that while our naked night vision is limited mostly to the Milky Way, and it's true that when you look up at the sky, most of the stars you're seeing, almost all of them are part of our own galaxy of our own Milky Way, but our sample space is not. Even if there were only one communicative society per galaxy, that still leaves us with billions of hypothetical entries on the Rolodex of hope. Admittedly, the terrible distances between galaxies could well preclude any communication beyond the science fictional, but it's good to think they're out there, those probabilistic star-flecked partners in space-time. And who knows, they may be better off than we are and have found the perfect intergalactic wormhole and are steadily heading our way. Please, please stop by any time, any star date, we can't promise, but we will try with all our heart and hemoglobin and every one of our 90 trillion body cells and our bacterial symbionts too, to hang on and to dodge our own bullets and be here when you arrive. Thank you very much. You've been watching a presentation and reading by Pulitzer Prize winning science writer, Natalie Angier. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer segment of the presentation. Natalie Angier was speaking at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon on May 16, 2007, reading from her latest book, The Canon, a whirligig tour of the beautiful basics of science. Natalie Angier is a science writer for the New York Times. Her work has also appeared in Discover Magazine, Time Magazine, and The American Scholar. 
Her previous books include Woman, An Intimate Geography, The Beauty of the Beastly, and Natural Obsessions. To find out more about Natalie Angier and her work, visit her website at www.natalieangier.com or check the science section of the New York Times. And now we return to the question and answer segment of the presentation. The first question for Natalie Angier is about her recommendations for teaching science, how to teach science more holistically in light of the fact that all the sciences are related in such important ways. Yes, that's true. They are all related. Um, well, I think that's what I try to do in this book. I try to bring them all together because uh, not just because they are all related, but because as I looked into them, I started to see the patterns all sort of feeding into one another. Um, as I said, I think that if you get a few of the basic concepts, that you can't help but make those connections yourself. And that's one of the things I like about science, is that it invites your own kind of investigation and your own thinking and your own really sort of just speculating about things. Um, I wish people would do more experiments sometimes you know you might want to even do data collection yourself i know i was just talking to this woman who who likes to go out and do data collection of uh the birds that she gets in her backyard she keeps pretty good track of them and sees how it changes from season to season these are the kinds of things that when you're actually doing that and, and being a careful observer uh, you start to feel more a part of it and science begins to seem less like a kind of an otherness or a ghetto or something out there you see that it's really just your, your participation in this very powerful tool of, of careful observation combined with um, maybe you're trying to do an experiment, or maybe you're just doing field work, but you're trying to analyze the data in a systematic way. So I don't think it's that hard uh, to participate. One of the exercises that I did and had people do is, you know, Learning how to estimate things, this is kind of a fun game. You might want to try it, uh, try to figure out. Uh, Enrico Fermi used to do this with his scientists when they were working on the Manhattan Project, you know, in between working on the bomb. So they, um, the, he would say he would expect anybody who worked for him to be able to come up with an estimate within an order of magnitude, as he said, of anything, any quantity that he could throw at him. How many pounds of food do you eat a year? Uh, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? That's the famous one. And he would expect them to be able to figure out uh, an algorithm, a way of getting to a reasonable estimate of it uh, just by the really sort of systematic, reductive thinking, again, taking that one at a time, one variable at a time, and coming up with something that gets you within that order of magnitude so that if, for example, there were 300 piano tuners in Chicago in reality, you would get an answer that would fall somewhere between 99 and 1,000, somewhere in those hundreds. So um, I take you through the process of doing that and you know, start to do it. My site gave my own example of how I tried to do it with trying to estimate how many school buses there were in my county or trying to estimate if you forget like how big the world, you know, how many miles around the world is, different ways, different little problems. You start getting into these kinds of thinking and, um, and you start to see the power of it in the same way that thinking probabilistically starts to give you a sense of power over your medical test results and other things in your life that you used to feel you didn't have control over. Uh, you can start to estimate a risk of something. Um, one of the teachers I talked to from Princeton says she has her students do a personal risk assessment for something they're concerned about. How many tuna sandwiches can I safely eat a week? Uh, is it bad for me to go to a nail salon and get my nails polished, you know, when there's all these volatile chemicals, that, some of which are, have been shown to be mutagens and carcinogens. So he, she has them sit and figure out for their own lives, do a risk assessment. You start doing these kinds of little fun things, and they are fun, and you, you can't help but become kind of a little scientist, uh, even, I think, at any stage of life, because you start to see that you get a sense of you get a sense of being able to get a handle on reality. So I think that that's probably the best way to approach it, is just step by step, the way scientists do. Yes? And you wrote an essay talking about why so many scientists haven't spoken up for evolution. Well, you didn't talk about why, actually, but expressing frustration that there was this acquiescence that everybody's idea is OK, including, say, 
saying that evolution isn't a core theory. And I wanted you to say something about why that, <clears throat> where this acquiescence is coming from, why people aren't speaking out. Well, the, yeah, the essay that I wrote that was called My God Problem and Theirs um, was more about Every sing because all the scientists were telling me that I have to tell people that evolution is real, I started to think, well, this is kind of one thing that they're picking out, whereas they're not challenging certain other beliefs that are just as questionable as creationism. For example, the resurrection or the virgin birth or you know things that um, religious people believe. And so I said, why are they afraid to talk about the incredible unlikelihood of any of that happening based on what we know about reality and speculating about, well, this difficulty that scientists have when they take on religion. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I do wish that there was more of a willingness to take on some of these questions because I feel that there's, uh, I, I use the comparison between how astronomers react to if someone says, do you believe in astrology? And they're just like, no, they're very, very scornful and dismissive. But if somebody says, well, has, has astronomy shown that there's a god? Then they become much more respectful, when in fact astronomy has done no such thing. I mean, astronomy is not even, there's no, nothing that's come out of astronomy that has really, I think, said anything about whether there's a god. But I think it's important, though, that scientists feel like they cannot alienate the public, they cannot alienate taxpayers. Um, I, I, you know, I can understand all their hesitations. At the same time, I do think that this unwillingness to take on all irrational thinking ultimately makes it harder for them to criticize a particular subset of irrational thinking. So I do urge scientists to approach it all as one big package deal. What's the evidence? Why is it kind of irrational to talk about something like the virgin birth when what we know of mammalian genetics really kind of precludes it? Um, so if we were to approach every kind of superstitious, supernatural thinking as open to severe you know, kind of withering criticism that scientists give each other, I think maybe that would be a it might be in the end more fruitful, but I don't know. I mean, this whole business of religion and science is just never ending, and you know, you have these, these symposia and these endless uh, hand wringing over it, and what are you going to do about it? I mean, people believe what they believe, and if you tell them, well, there's no God, you, you don't have a right to say that, I guess, but the probability of it is very low. And so I think, <laughs> you know. I'm... Okay, I have a question. Okay. All right. Um, what, about, uh, what about ESP? What do you think about ESP? And you, you, have, you don't believe in spirituality at all? On, on that, uh, and then what about uh, some of the people that um, help detectives find dead bodies and so on, which is a fact of reality, and they just do it through uh, somehow visions or ideas that they have that come to them, uh, which is ESP, which is extrasensory perception, and that kind of thing, which leads to spirituality, which leads to the fact that we aren't just physical beings, but we have a lot of people believe, very intelligent people believe we have a soul. And that whole idea, which is very true, and there's a proof of auras that people see when, after they've died, and things like this that have actually happened in reality. Some people have also seen ghosts. So I just want your views on some of that. Um, <clears throat> the things that you were just citing that have been yeah. shown, sign, no. I, this, Just hit on some of that. I'm not trying yeah, to Yeah, no, the I. Question. The question about, uh, for example, police work. Um, in fact, none of that has really been shown to be at all better than uh, randomness and sometimes less than random. Um, no, that's not true. There's well, I mean, it's really been... You were asked to ask a question. No, I'm just Please. saying that's not true. There's been actual many, many people... That have been well, good. yeah, I mean, if these things, if these things could be so scientifically demonstrated and reproduced with all the controls that you apply in a normal scientific procedure, if that were true, 
scientists have no reason to deny it. They only deny things for which they think the evidence is not good. And so I don't really know. I have never actually talked to a scientist who takes that stuff seriously. Um, and people accuse scientists of being narrow-minded, but what they are is just data-minded. I, I, you know, I think people can, you can, you can think that there are souls, but you have to sort of define souls in a way that they don't interfere with reality, that's all. Absolutely. I mean, if, if they start picking up and moving spoons around through their thoughts, then that's really kind of not. No, I'm talking about fact-based things that have happened in this country, and you're not there's a, there's a too aware of it, I guess. Yes. Um, maybe related. It seems to me that the a lot of the public is not just ignorant about science or indifferent to science, but they actually have a fair bit of antipathy to science. And I wonder if you agree and whether you have any thoughts on why that is. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because if you compare the attitude towards science now than, say, back in the Kennedy era, and when we had the space race, which was a great source of inspiration to all Americans and scientists uh, who were kids at the time said that you know they were kind of science geeks who were considered very sexy because it was science at that point was, was considered very appealing. It was also a time when people had a lot of, I think, more optimism about the future. And if you remember that there was a kind of um, an almost infatuation with the future, we saw it in the World's Fair and just the way in which people envisioned everything in, architecture and design, and everything was designed towards uh, um, kind of glorifying the futuristic. And so we thought things were getting better. Maybe now we don't think that. We think things are getting poorer, and we're really worried about the future. And with that worry, I think, comes this tendency to pull in instead of looking out or looking at something as being progressive. We think that somehow that it's deceived us or it's disappointed us, and that's just speculation on my part as to why people have become disillusioned. And uh, yes, chemical degradation of the environment, this is a problem, um, but I don't think we can really blame science for that. I think we can maybe blame certain corporate sort of economic factors that push this forward, not, not science. So somehow we have to kind of, that's why I, I keep emphasizing the the optimism of science, if we could sort of rediscover what scientists themselves feel in their own research, which is unfailingly optimistic, um, maybe that would help instead of focusing on our fears. Yes? I have two questions. One, um, I'm concerned about the uh, fate of newspapers, and what's your take on the understanding of, our understanding of, of science news as newspapers continue to shrink and be pushed aside by the internet? My second question is um, your organization and approaching the canon in terms of your writing, the structure, did you do all your reporting first and then figure out how you were going to write this or did you have a pretty strong concept of where you were going to go with this piece before you did your reporting? No, I, I, I didn't really know where it was going to go but um, after talking to scientists enough and seeing re recurring themes and the same pleas coming up again and again, uh, it helped. Um, but I also had to kind of be selective and leave a lot of stuff out, and that, that was just more a question of not wanting to make this thing too overwhelming. But uh, I didn't actually know at the beginning what would be, I, I knew which disciplines I wanted to look at because I was looking at the ones that were, you know, typically considered the harder sciences, the ones that people feel perhaps the most alienated from. Um, so those are the ones I focused on. Uh, but in the end, yes, the reporting drove the organization. In terms of your first question about newspapers, yes, this is a source of major concern. Newspapers everywhere have cut back on their science coverage, have cut back on their science pages. I, you know, My husband is actually also a science reporter. He's at the Washington Post, and he's also a very active Guild member, and he hears from unemployed science writers everywhere. I mean, it's just amazing. All the senior science writers, a lot of them have lost their jobs, uh, whether it's from the Dallas you know, Morning News or the San Jose Mercury News or the Philadelphia Inquirer. I could go on and on. So it's just been this catastrophic process that I don't know what's going to replace it because I don't, I don't, 
personally know how reliable it is to just have things done on the web as opposed to having uh, something a little bit more structured like a newspaper. Oh, also TV stations, TV news, getting rid of their science reporters and their medical reporters. So yes, this is a, a, a big problem. And personally, I think it's, I think, I think it's really sad. I think just now when we need more of it, we're having less of it. But it, I don't know what's going to stop the trend, and I don't know what's going to take its place. I do think that people who are teaching science journalism programs now are advising their students to think about writing. Oh, well, one thing that is coming up that's more and more of universities are developing their own science reporting and science journalism. So they, rather than just sending out press releases to these vanishing number of outlets, they're creating their own science reporting on their websites that have real stories and they try to actually treat them as stories as opposed to just press releases. Which I guess, you know, I mean, I could see where that, that could be good if, if they're reporting on what their researchers are doing in a way that's actually pretty in depth. Um, but there's always, of course, the problem of the inevitable tendency to just want to talk about how great it is instead of some of the critics from another university, for example. So there's that. But maybe, you know, maybe things like that will step in and, and help fill in the gaps because the newspapers aren't doing it. Yes? You managed to delicately make, remain unbiased and eloquent about everything you've written about. And these emotionally charged, you wrote this beautiful piece on September 11th that was wonderful. And you've edited science uh, books. And it's just, amazing to me that you managed to traipse through these landmines so beautifully, beautifully, without managing to, it seems, get so involved in it yourself. And I don't really know how you do that. I tackle these emotionally charged, very big topics and still manage to put it on paper and make it readable and still beautiful. Well, thank you. Uh, one of the things I find very good about writing is it tends to really kind of, it makes you a, a bit less of a hysterical person. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I tend to really, uh, you know, my, my, my husband bought me a soapbox. I mean this. He went out and found this old antique soapbox because every morning I sit and rant so over the newspaper. But when I sit down and write, I try to actually get past that, uh, just because I feel like to just sort of take a longer view or a wider view or, or more compassionate view than, than I might in my own personal life, which is why I like writing. And I hate to see that go. And sometimes I think that maybe the instantaneous nature of, of the web and blogging it seems like the vitriol, it takes my breath away sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe it's just because people are just doing it too quickly, right? They're not thinking. And if you sort of force yourself to sit down and actually try to think and organize your thoughts and really sort of go through an issue rather than just giving your first knee jerk reaction, it, I think people tend to be a lot, a lot more sensible. <laughs> Yes. Do you make a distinction between a scientific theory and a well substantiated theory or a fact? Do you, do you make a I talk very, I talk in some detail at the uh, evolution chapter about the difference between a hypothesis and a theory, and uh, one of the tragedies is that the word theory in common language tends to mean the same thing as a hypothesis, just an idea that you might have, a hunch, um, whereas in among scientists, a scientific theory is something that is actually an, basically this kind of umbrella theme that pulls together a lot of observations and facts and hypotheses that have been shown to be correct through experimentation. And so a theory is never just a theory. So when people talk about, oh, it's just a theory, they're misunderstanding the nature of the word theory from a scientist's point of view. So I do talk about that and what it is that it takes to become a theory, as opposed to a hypothesis, which is the starting point for any experiment. Yes? I'm just starting to let you know that we're taking a Science of Women's Bodies class at PSU and we're using your book, The Women's and the Geography, as the textbook. And it makes a lot of very complicated things very easy to understand. And I think it's very helpful to get into the science 
Ms. Brown with your Oh, thank you. I'm going to hire this. Okay. <laughs> yes. Do you know what your next book will be? <laughs> that sort of presupposes that there will be a next book. I mean, along with newspapers, the books are, you know, I don't know. I mean, what's the future of books? This is a big question. Um, people seem to have less and less time to read books. And so, whew, boy, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But at the moment, no, I, I, I don't have another book in mind, um, except maybe a kid's book. I, I, kids still seem to read a lot of books. That's one thing. They're, they're still avid. Or at least kids who like to read seem to like to read a lot of books. So maybe I'll write something for kids. Mm -hmm. Do you see the, uh, ur uh, the uh, current urgency of going from uh, writing a popular science book that's fun and cool, in, in your words, to also or maybe more uh, piercing, hauntingly uh, true, where people can't easily just recover from it, but it makes them want to research into it and it can affect their ethical and moral, and uh, you see the urgency of that, or just keeping it cool as the best way yeah. to. Yeah, no, I, I do think there is a lot of urgency to it. Um, I think that, I mean, mostly I, I do think that rational scientific thinking is, is a, a good tonic for a lot of problems, um, and I do see the urgency of it. I. I I think that urgency and a sense of wonder are, to me, kind of really two sides of the same coin. So uh, whether, if, if people sort of fall in love with something, then I think they want to protect it, right? So I guess that's the idea, is to make people fall in love and then think that this is something that is worth preserving. One of the things that's happening now is the science in this country, which has always been one of our great strengths, is starting to suffer from many different fronts, both from the difficulty that people have of uh, foreign students coming to study here, from this feeling like the United States has kind of lost a lot of its reputation as having real integrity when it comes to the scientific enterprise. This is the first time that this has happened with this administration, but they've managed to do this. Um, so it's going to take a little while to recover from that. And I worry that we may be, have lost ground. I mean, everybody knows that in China and India, they're just churning out scientists and engineers. But also, Europe has really recovered from World War II in a big way. And so they've, I, I can only say this by looking through the journals and seeing where all the scientific reports are coming from. It used to be that everything was coming, most of it was coming from American universities. But that's not the truth, the, the case anymore. So. The urgency I see there is, if we don't have science, what do we have to offer economically? We don't make anything anymore. So I think that it's a big part of our economic and just our ability to sort of maintain any kind of status in the world. So, mm, boy, I would really like people to feel the sense of urgency there, too. Anyway, I'll take one more question. You wrote a piece, I think it was in one of your books as well, which was a critique of, of gender science or sociobiology dealing with issues of gender. And, I, and so that sort of struck me as you, you taking a, little, a look at bad science. And I wonder if in, in working on this book, if you've come across other examples in other fields uh, where you can sort of recognize real problems with how science was being conducted. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think one of the problems is that evolutionary psychology, as far as I can tell, continues to have a lot of difficulties of, uh, it's kind of swept along and it's swept a lot of things in its path. Uh, boy, a lot of, a lot of stuff that's, that's being peddled now I think is really questionable science. So that continues to be a source of great dismay to me. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, this sort of this, this one of these softer sciences which begins to, to kind of fool people into thinking that the scientific method has been followed when it hasn't necessarily and that there's a lot of 
For example, one of the things that you're supposed to do as a scientist, you really are, and it's very important to do it, is to be your own worst enemy, to want to disprove what you want to be true. That your job as a good scientist is to conduct an experiment that will blast down your result that you want so badly to be true. And that is uh, something that I think the, the, a lot of evolutionary psychologists seem like they, they're doing just the opposite, that they're trying to kind of buttress what they want to be true, even in the face of countervailing evidence. And this is a very dangerous tendency because I think that one of the strengths of science is uh, that you are always serving as the person who's, you're not, you're not wedded to your beliefs. You, and one of the scientists said, why do you think we spend so much time in graduate school and in training? It's to get rid of our own biases. I mean, that's the hardest part of doing science, is you have these biases, it's human nature maybe, and you have to figure out, you have to know the system to get rid of them. You have to do the experiment, you have to design it to knock it down, because if you're not, you're not gonna do good science. And that's, of course, ultimately what I think a lot of evolutionary psychology overlooks. And, and I only say that because I know these guys start talking about it that way. It's like if somebody disagrees with their interpretation of their results, they get all like, you know, hissy about it and say, oh, well, you know, Galileo was also, you know, he was also he had to suffer so much before anyone believed him. <laughs> this is not the way a scientist should talk. It's just not like, oh, feeling so persecuted um, because somebody came up with an alternative interpretation to your data. That's what they're supposed to do. That's how science is done. This is not, they sort of accuse it of being anti scientific and too political. This is science in action. So, Larry Summers lost his job from Harvard because he was uh, busy listening to some of this stuff. And so um, that continues to be a field. What's evolutionary psychology? Yeah, well, evolutionary psychology is you know, t trying to understand how our human nature evolves and not just saying, well, evolutionary biology, which may ask why we have, you know, sort of say, strange structure of the voice box being right next to um, <clears throat> the food pipe, uh, but also asking what the evolutionary background of our, of our feelings, our, our impulses, our desires may be, the psych human psychology, the evolution of our psychology. And that, that has given rise to a lot of questionable um, results and work, and it continues to be a, a real I mean, there's some good work, definitely some good science going on there, but a lot of it, it just it falls prey to what I was saying, is that people, because people have such strong feelings about psychology, they, they tend to cling to their beliefs in a way that is ultimately not good science. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. You've been watching a presentation and reading by Pulitzer Prize winning science writer Natalie Angier. She was speaking at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon on May 16, 2007, reading from her latest book, The Canon, a whirligig tour of the beautiful basics of science. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about this program and about the many other video and audio programs in our library, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. Thank you for watching, and thank you for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots democratic community media. ...of chemicals that actually um, begin scraping at the enamel, and you can't see any of these little microbes. You know, if you had a, a pin, a head of a pin, you could probably wallpaper the top of them of that head with about 20 million of them, but you can feel them if you have your finger across your teeth and you feel that slimy stuff, that's actually the dental plaque there. Um, so when you brush and floss away at night and you gargle with Listerine, if you're like me, uh, you know, I do this now, I brush for at least two minutes a night, I have three different kinds of floss, I use Listerine for two minutes, and you kill like 99.9% .9 of them. But here's the thing, the next day, uh, they're all back again. <laughs> and not just willy-nilly either. They'll be back, she says, with the same highly ordered structure, the same architecture every time. 
So I've been very vigilant about waging war against plaque, and Bassler made me understand on a sort of cellular and molecular level why it was necessary to do so. Uh, so the principles of the architecture of that organization, the principles that I'm trying to get at here and tell you that my personal story of dental plaque really all come down to power of the cell, the cell, the bacterium is a cell, and the power of the bacteria is in the fact that the cell is this really powerful principle that I discuss in the canon as a basic organizing principle of life on Earth. So we have these cells that are able to do these amazing things, individual single-celled organisms that these bacteria Yes, thank you. I have to say I deserve that applause. And uh, <laughs> not because of my new book, not because of my new book, but because it's been almost, it's been almost 10 years to the day since my last root canal. <laughs> and I know a lot of you don't think that's a big deal. A lot of you may have never had one. There may even be some people in the audience who have never, you probably never, you don't think I deserve applause for this, but for me, this extended period of, they've tried very hard to forget, a lot of them have said that to me, they've been trying to recover from their high school chemistry teacher, um, and they're, you know, 52 years old, and they're still in recovery, so there's a lot of problems with the way science is taught, and so I, after writing about science and science news, for so many years, I decided, well, it's time to talk about the basics again, because I actually think that if you have a grasp of the basics, it's much easier to follow the news. I mentioned cells. Of course, stem cells are very much in the news. But one of the things I found is that most people don't really understand what a cell is or why we even, I mean, why we're arguing over stem cells. So getting back to the basics getting some of these basic ideas across. If you have them in place, if you have a grasp of them, it's a lot easier to follow the news, to follow all of these ideas that are coming up that are really important to us, uh, you know, genetic engineering. Do we know what DNA is? Do we know where genes are located? Do we know what they do? These are all ideas that I think people feel maybe a little bit embarrassed about that they don't quite know. So I thought, well, okay, maybe this is something to put together into a book. What I did in putting together the canon is I went around and talked to scientists all over the country, indeed even uh, all over the world. I asked them, what do you wish people understood about science? And um, I mean, most of them, of course, want people to understand enough about science so that they just give them unlimited grants and don't ask any questions, but tooth happiness is a real achievement. It's my smile stone. I have a terrible teeth, a tragic dental history. I've had nine root canals, 12 crowns, two bridges, and approximately 4,328 cavities filled. <laughs> Okay, that was an exaggeration. <laughs> I've spent so much time in a dental chair that they should probably endow one in my name, except I've also been a really terrible dental patient, and uh, my last dentist moved to Germany. <laughs> I think that I, I gave rise to this idea that dentists have a high rate of suicide. Um, I used to think that this was my fate, and there was nothing I could do about it. 
But then I actually learned that there is something you can do about it as long as you're willing to be extremely vigilant. And I learned about the actual basis for this need for vigilance from Bonnie Bassler, who was this wonderful microbiologist at Princeton University, who really let me know what kind of enemy I was up against, and that is dental plaque. Uh, she explained to me that about 600 different species of bacteria cooperate in the job of causing whatever dental problems you have, whether cavities or, or gum disease. And each one of these different species of bacteria is really as different from one another as humans would be from Martians, she said. So you have one species that might be able to metabolize the sugar residues on your teeth, another is good at clinging to the enamel. The next might release these abrasorium are. And at the same time, the second organizing principle of these bacteria and the reason why they cause what's, you know, create what's almost like a multicellular organism in your mouth is that they're able to communicate with each other. So they're actually always signaling each other. And in fact, that's the way multicellular organisms work. They have the autonomy of the individual cell combined with this incredible ability to communicate, unlike me at the moment. Um, and in fact, when they recently sequenced the entire human genome, they found that half of the genes in it seem to be dedicated to cell-cell communication. It's a sort of original cell phoning going on here. <laughs> so the principle, the basic principle of the cell, the basic principle of cells communicating with each other, this autonomy combined with community, is one of these things that's basic to understanding biology and the organization of life on Earth. This is the approach that I take in the canon. I talk about things always on these kinds of ultimate ideas of each field. I've been a science writer now. I just realized this <clears throat> for more than half my life, and I've spent my, my life writing mostly about science news. But in the course of doing that, I came to understand that for most people, all science is news. I mean, it's just true that people don't really pay attention, they don't understand or follow some of the basic ideas that underlie the news. The basic um, principles, the basic starting points that they may have learned in school and forgotten, or maybe they never learned or they didn't care, 